All right. Welcome to uh, info to go um, This event is brought to you by the Idaho Commission for Libraries with funding support through the Institute of Museum and Library Services. My name is Dylan Baker. Um, I'm one of your hosts today. Um, I am the broadband consultant here at the Commission for Libraries. I also have another host here today. Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Tammy Hollyhouse, and I am the brand new continuing education consultant for the Commission for Libraries. Some of you might know me. I've been here a couple years in another role, but we would like to welcome you today to this session. Fantastic. Thank you for being here. We are recording this session, so if you do have to step away or miss anything, um, it will be recorded. It will be available for anybody to watch later. It will be uh, made available on our info to go archives on our website. Um, and, and one more last time, if you're experiencing any issues whatsoever, feel free to type those in the chat. Also, if you have any questions for our presenter at any time, feel free to type those in the chat. Um, we will uh, make sure that he hears them. But uh, now at this time, I would like to introduce our uh, presenter we have here today. Um, I, uh, I'm not usually the person running or hosting these info to goes but I wanted to be here because I had thought this, this session was uh, particularly relevant for my interests and hopefully yours as well. Um, our presenter here today is Adam Day of the Twin Falls Public Library and he has a fantastic session here telling you about a tool um, that he's put together to manage use of public computing workstations and printers by the public in his library. and. Uh, Kind of how that's developed, where it's going, what kind of features, and he's got a demo for us. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and hand this over to Adam. All right, can. Uh... Can you guys, can everybody hear Adam? We may be just having issues on our side. Adam, Dylan and I cannot hear yeah, you. Yeah, it looks like people in the chat can't hear you either, Adam. We just had this tested, but evidently not sufficiently. Okay, people can't hear anything. Well, thank you. You guys are getting a live technical demo here. <laughs> <laughs> we'll give Adam here a moment, see if we can figure out what is going on Hello. there we are adam we can hear you now all right cool. evidently the mute button doesn't unmute when you expect it to so <laughs> all right I, I had the perfect intro for everybody but that's now wasted so we're going to go ahead and just move forward <laughs> um again my name is adam dam with the twin falls public library um thank you all for for attending um thank you to the icfl and for uh dylan and tammy for hosting this um Basically, what we're going to be going over is our story uh, on how we got to a point of developing our own public computing and print management um, software solution. Um, and so hopefully by the end of uh, uh, the, my spiel, um, we can do a quick live demo and then uh, have some open time for some questions that anybody may have. Um, I would also like to just uh, offer that if, if we don't get to, a, a, if I don't answer any of the questions uh, that somebody uh, throws in the chat, feel free to email me. Um, I'll have my email address up here in just a moment, and uh, um, I'd be happy to sit down and have a long one with anybody at that point. So we'll go ahead and get started. So we're going to do um, public uh, computing and printing, and this is me. Um, I'm uh, the IT specialist here at the Twin Falls Public Library. Started at uh, Twin Falls Public Library March 2010, um, and have been slaving away since then. Um, previously to that, I worked for Dell for five years, where I gained a lot of technical experience um, in that field. Um, and some of that's carried over into what I do here at the library. Um, as you can see, my email address is right down there, and you're welcome to jot that down, shoot me a message at any point, any time, and I'd be happy to talk with you. Um, so moving forward. So what we're going to go over today, um, basically four things, and we're going to flesh out into a lot of this um, in, a, you know, in more depth. Uh, first, I want to talk about kind of our background, where we came from, um, which will bleed into our uh, evaluation process and development uh, process for uh, coming up with our solution. 
Um, we, I also want to kind of just skim off the surface of talking about taking, uh, it, when developing our software, we wanted to take kind of a new stance of developing the software to support the policies that our library was uh, uh, wanting to establish. And then once we kind of had that discussion, roll into um, the environment demo and a software demo if possible. So um, I do have a lot, and uh, I'm, I'm going to kind of keep Dylan uh, as my timekeeper here because I will get wordy as we go along. So <laughs> if we feel we're kind of beating a dead horse, let me know, and we'll, we'll move forward, and hopefully we can get to that live demo part. So a little bit of our background, Twin Falls, Idaho, um, our library serves a population of about 48,000 people. Um, uh, we have, as, as we sit right now, 43 public computers, 18 adult desktops, as you can see, 10 uh, adult laptops. We do have two Windows laptops available, and we can talk about that a little later. Uh, five children desktops and 18 uh, desktops. Um, so we have kind of like three zones, if you will, of, of computer stations. Uh, they're all kind of clumped together based off of those zones. Um, along with that, we have two print release stations uh, located both in the youth and adult areas. Um, in our building, we, we have multiple levels. So the adult computers are in the um, mid-level of our building out of the three. And then the, the youth and teen areas are in the lower level of the building. So we have two, uh, a release station for, for both of those locations as well as payment kiosks available for both of those lo locations. Um, to kind of give you some more background, our previous setup was in a, in a way similar. Um, we had 38 public stations at the time all running Windows 7. Uh, we were using a third-party product to do our time management and print management. Um, you can see the, the breakdown of systems is roughly the same. Really, when we made our transition over to our new system, we wanted to expand our teen area, which is what we did. Um, so we don't see a, a, a huge influx of, of computer systems that we added at that point. Um, but that just gives you kind of a, a rough idea that we were able to build a solution that would fit the already established layout of our network. Um, we, at the time, we only had two public printers. Um, these were not Q printers. They were just um, printers that were literally hooked up to the network. And then as print jobs were released to those printers, they were just printed right there. There wasn't a queue that they would be stored into. And one of the more problematic issues we were running into is we only had a single payment kiosk, uh, which was just a, sing, uh, was just a coin op, didn't have credit card processing, and it was only located in our adult um, section of the, the library. So as you can imagine, if you had teens or youth that were in the lower section of the library wanted to add money to their account, they would have to go upstairs to do that than to come back down and, and print. And we didn't feel that that was the, the most uh, intuitive process for our patrons to follow. So um, our policy at the time kind of followed these, these highlights right here. Um, each patron was allowed one one and a half hour session per day. Um, they had limited login attempts, meaning that uh, at, at and that did adjust later on in life, but initially a patron was allowed to log into a computer up to three times. If they, they, they log, needed to log in in addition to that, over that three, uh, three mark limit, uh, staff would have to engage and allow um, additional logins to occur. Um, we required our accounts to be authenticated, our patron accounts to be authenticated over our ILS at the time, which was a Cersei Dynix product, um, using SIP2. And we were requiring pins to be a barcode matched with a pin to be able to authenticate the user. Um, I kind of call that out right now because really that was a huge question driver from our, our patron base. Um, I don't know if anybody has um, had a similar situation, but we had a lot of questions that were like, I forgot my pin number. And so we were going through that recovery process with patrons on a constant basis. Um, Pre-E-rate funding, so when we, did, um, when we didn't have E-rate funding, uh, the library was charging a dollar for additional 30-minute sessions. Um, after our E-rate funding came into place, um, we adjusted that so that express sessions were 30 minutes, and those were free for patrons to request at that point. No longer was there a charge associated with that. Um, Kind of like I mentioned earlier, um, the system was set up so that when a patron would want to print a, uh, a document, um, it would charge their account and then release the job directly to a network printer, um, requiring that patron to get up out of their station and walk over to the print release or the printer and recover their document. There wasn't there was a lack of security in that setup, and we wanted to change that. Um, 
Uh, I was just looking at the chat real quick. Maddie says our patrons' pins are automatically set to their birth dates, and yet we're always getting the what's my pin question anyway. And that's exactly uh, the environment that we were running. So um, we didn't do birth dates. We did uh, um, something to do with the, the patron's phone number. Um, but, you know, something as simple as that was still generating a lot of questions uh, for our staff to handle. So uh, we wanted to see if we could approach the, the solution that we came up with with a a new look, a new way of, of handling it to reduce those questions, but still allow some some form of security for our patrons to log in. We're going to kind of go over that a little bit. So thank you for commenting, Maddie. So um, that was how our system was kind of set up, what I just went over. Um, moving forward, I had been here for um, at least seven years at the point of uh, identifying that it was time to really look at a new solution for our, our, our public computers. We'd been running the system for seven plus years. Um, we were running a Windows 7 client. We know the end of life of Windows 7 is approaching quickly. Um, and uh, the hardware that this system was using, especially our payment kiosk hardware, was um, getting harder and harder to refresh. Um, we did hit a point where we had hardware fail, and the company had to literally find a, um, uh, an already used part to send to us to be able to get this thing running, uh, with pretty much the promise of this may be the last time that we're able to do that. Um, so, you know, that was one consideration or one kind of flag that we had to um, identify with to, to say, hey, you know, maybe it's time to move to something different. Um, we, we struggled a little bit with um, uh, the, the client software and the maintenance schedule that we had to do with that. So what I'm kind of referring to there is we were running Windows 7. Um, on top of that, we were running, uh, well, Windows 7 in a domained environment. So we were using Active Directory and group policies to control the user environment. Um, which wasn't too difficult to manage. However, to add to that complexity, we were running Deep Freeze, which is a disk locking application, um, which just made it that uh, just made one more hoop that we had to jump through to be able to run updates on those client systems, um, uh, do you know any type of upgrades or you know like I said updates. Um, the, the the it made it for a very cumbersome process. So to be able to, to apply updates, we had to boot systems, unlock them, run updates, which would happen in their own time frame, if you will. They wouldn't always end at the same time. Then we had to make sure we could you know, uh, lock those systems back down, reboot, and make sure we brought everything back up and, and, and were ready to go by the time the, the doors opened in the morning. Um, so it was just a very cumbersome process, and we wanted to see if there was uh, another product out there that could potentially uh, make that a little easier. Um, and then on top of that, you know, working with any third-party vendor, uh, we, we discovered that we were having, um, you know, difficulties resolving some very simplistic things just because we didn't have access to the tools or the, the, the knowledge to be able to resolve some of the problems that we were experiencing. And so, you know, there was that kind of um, layer to our problem where we're like the support model that we were receiving didn't really fit the needs that we had. Um, so that was kind of our, our point of, okay, now let's have a serious discussion as to um, how we move forward and what we need to move to. So that takes us to our evaluation process. Um, so basically, we sat down and had this big powwow with our staff and, and, um, and all parties that were involved with this. Um, everything from the tech side to patron facing side and, and identified our needs and our wants. And, and the breakout is pretty simple. The needs are this is what the system has to be able to accomplish. This is mission critical. Um, our wants are kind of like the icing on the cake. If we can get it to um, do it or have those features or, uh, or those capabilities, awesome. That would be um, even better. So, so we really boiled down what are our, our needs versus our wants, and I'll kind of talk through them here just really quick. So um, under our needs, we need to make sure we had a timely implementation of a new solution. So if, if um, anybody is thinking about going and either implementing something like this into their library that hasn't implemented time management to their, their, their environment yet, or is looking at transitioning, give yourself a plenty of runway to make that adjustment and that change. Um, so we were sitting at about a year out of um, our contract running out with our current vendor at the time. And so we felt that we needed to research and identify which route we wanted to take. And that's what this breakdown basically helped us identify with, what our needs were. So we knew we needed to make sure uh, that a timely implementation was there so that if we discovered however many different possible solutions could be applied to our situation, 
um, we would have enough time to make that happen effectively. We wanted a solution that could um, address some of the, the patron privacy and security concerns. And, and really what that talks to is I wanted an environment that um, basically allowed the patron to log in and anything they did within that, that environment could be either removed, <clears throat> excuse me, removed, deleted, or, or destroyed, if you will, so that the next patron that sits down at that system wouldn't have an opportunity to be able to access something they're not supposed to. So case in point, um, patron downloads medical records, tax records, whatever the case may be on a public computer, and then either, or even as simple as just leaving a, a browser session open and, and being logged into their email or bank account, getting up away from the computer, forgetting to log out, and the next patron that logs in, you know, would potentially have access to an already established web browser session that's already logged into somebody else's web, uh, account, or they forgot to delete the, uh, the, the download off the desktop or the downloads folder. I wanted something that could handle that for us where we didn't have to think about it, and more importantly, the patron didn't have to think about it. Um, so that was one of our requirements. Um, next, of course, naturally, it has to handle session time. So we wanted to make sure that we could establish rules and um, apply um, our policies to the tool in such a way that would, would fit. Um, we, wanted, we required print management with cost recovery. What that means is we needed a system that could handle print queues. Um, as well as handle the uh, transaction, the monetary transaction that would occur for those, those print jobs. So um, that was a requirement for us. That, that sometimes isn't a model that all libraries necessarily go with because there is a cost involved with that, but that was something that we felt was um, uh, of essence and we needed to make sure that that was implemented. Um, we, I wanted to make sure that there was a central, uh, central staff management tool available. Um, what I was getting at there was I didn't want the, 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 um, the setup to be where not only did we have to install client software on our public computers, but then for every staff member that needed to be able to manage those systems, I didn't want to have to install um, um, a staff client software, if you will, on those computers. I wanted a central one tool that everybody has access to that could manage the system um, as, as needed. Um, and then, of course, um, being that we are a library, we just have to log everything. So um, we, uh, you know, we had to make sure that um, usage um, statistics were being captured in, in, a, in a meaningful way to allow us to be able to uh, do our reporting. So those are our needs. Um, if we look over at the want side here, um, again, icing on the cake. But we were looking at, you know, hey, is there a zero cost solution out there or a more affordable solution than what we had currently experienced? Um, you know, if we can make that happen and it saves us money, absolutely. Uh, that's somewhere we would go. Um, we wanted not only our stat, our, our, the, in, the, the session management piece not only has it, doesn't need to run on the, the client's uh, um, public computers and the staff computers, with some type of uh, interface, but we wanted to make sure that interface was intuitive. It took um, minimal training to be able to uh, ramp up both our patrons and our staff to, to using the tool. So a lot about the user experience kind of lies within that. Um, this kind of coincides with the central staff management tool. If I was going to run a central tool, I wanted, you know, it makes sense that it needs to be web-based um, for the staff to be able to log in and manage those sessions. So that was my dream. Um, as far as uh, what I was looking for there. And we also wanted to, uh, the, the system to be scalable. So if um, we're going to be running the system for, you know, however many years, um, you know, if you, you know, predicting the future is, is almost impossible, but we're always trying to strive to get bigger and get better. So of course that naturally could translate to more systems, more zones, more uh, computers in our library. So we wanted the system to be able to scale with us um, as we moved forward. Um, Icing on the cake again, go out there and do some real um, hard research to see if there were open source technologies um, that were used to develop out um, already existing tools. So we looked at that. Um, ultimately, we wanted to um, have a solution that could run on multiple platforms so we weren't limited to just running on a Windows uh, environment, but maybe a mixed environment. And then kind of alluding to or talking about what I, I did just previously in the other slide is I wanted a system that could handle uh, client-side software updates and upgrades um, in a more easy and manageable fashion. So there's our, our needs and wants. 
So I, I would highly recommend that any library that wants to kind of move in a different direction or apply a, a setup like this to go through a similar um, um, decision process, if you will, like this. Evaluate what your core business model or core needs are, what do you ultimately need it to do, and see if it matches with one your budget and the feature set that you're looking for. So um, with that, we continued to research, um, you know, first, are there any paid third-party solutions out there? And here's basically the outcome of the research that we did. Um, I'm not going to go into naming specific products. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll encourage you to go out there, and if, if you're interested in looking at it, I'd be happy to uh, have a chat with you uh, off, offline here and, and, and uh, share some of that information. But from what we discovered, if you were going to go with a, a paid third-party solution, there was a high financial commitment that you would have to bear. So that means anything from initial cost of implementation, training, um, which would involve staff time, um, and then also sustained cost going forward for any type of licensing or um, support costs um, on a yearly basis generally. With that, I, we, we discovered that there, there are some really great products out there, but for a very high cost. And with that high cost came with possibly, you know, in a, in a lot of situations, limited feature sets. So some of the things that we wanted to try to accomplish and do, um, the tool could be maybe spun in a way that allowed that to happen if we paid additional you know, funds to have uh, a customized feature developed out for it. But for the most part, the core um, feature sets that those products had, they were limited to what they uh, specified. So that was kind of a, a, a turn down, if you will. Um, the, next, we looked at um, platform support. So can it run on Windows, you know, Mac, Linux? Um, we found that there was, uh, you know, some would work on one platform better than it wouldn't on the other. There was just not a, a, an overall well-rounded um, product that we could def um, find that would, would do it all. Um, we also had to consider, you know, what was their update and feature release cycle. So as we ran into problems or they, you know, develop out a new version of their software, how does that look? What does it cost? How frequently does that happen? You know, how does that, you know, improve or break or change the environment that you're wor working within. So we had to kind of look at that as well. Um, the one thing I will say is that a paid third-party solution, probably the, uh, the biggest benefit, one of the biggest benefits, I should say, are its third-party support. So basically, you have a support avenue. If you have problems, you have issues, you know, picking up the phone and calling somebody is, is a, a huge help. Um, so, you know, that should be part of your decision process as well as to identify what support avenues you may have. So, <clears throat> as, a, excuse me, as opposed to that, we also looked at free third-party solutions. Of course, naturally, it's a lower financial commitment because it's free software. Um, again, we still ran into a problem of limited features, so you're kind of at the, uh, the mercy of whoever's developing that free software. These are the features that it has. Um, Again, we, we discovered that there's limited platform support, um, um, and the, you're, again, limited to the update and feature release cycle to the developer. So, you know, it's a slower going developing software, if you will. And then, of course, there is no necessary dedicated support avenue for you to reach out to. So we weren't sure if this was the, the, the right fit for us, and so we evaluated how we could go about doing our own solution. So. <clears throat> excuse me, looking at that, um, we determined that it's a low to medium financial commitment. Um, with, uh, with that said, you know, just because we're developing our software and it's not costing us any, anything for licensing, there's a ton of staff time um, to develop something out like this to make it a successful um, uh, product. So, you know, you have to kind of keep that in mind and that's something we were willing to, to um, dive into. Probably one of the biggest benefits of it, though, were we were able to mold the software to exactly what we wanted. Um, and so that, that, and that doesn't stop there. As our needs grow and change, we can continue to develop against our, our platform to, to add and, and build in new features um, as we move along. So that's, I think, is one of the higher benefits. Um, the cool thing is, since we're developing it, it would feel wrong to say that we're only going to develop for, for one platform. Um, so naturally, you know, uh, when going through the process of developing out our solution, um, initially we had, had, had um, looked at making the 
uh, system only run on a single platform to kind of proof of concept everything with the intent of migrating to a platform that would be able to or a, a solution that would be able to run on multiple platforms. So um, I'm going to talk about that just a little bit more further on down the presentation here. So um, the other thing is um, by establishing our own, process, our, our own software, we were able to um, handle the situation of updates and features and future development. So we could build in that, that want of um, being able to push new updates and new software to our computers in a manageable way that makes it pretty much off hands, which is really nice. Um, and then probably the worst thing about it is there is absolutely zero support <laughs> for it. We are our own. So um, when problems uh, occur, we have to pony up and, and find a solution. So, um, you know, that is and can be a, a um, daunting thought. However, um, I think by taking everything that, that you know, my, my five or seven years of experience running a certain product and seeing some of the problems and some of the, the good things and, and the workflows that staff were utilizing to, to um, maintain that system, I was able to take those things and resolve a lot of those problematic issues we were running with our old system and build it into a new system so that they were just automated and handled. Now, I'm not saying it's a golden tool, doesn't solve everything, but what it does is it shifts the need from working on, wow, the tool can handle that better, and so we make it do that. And now we run into other additional problems uh, moving forward, which I'm going to kind of skim off the top of here in just a little bit. But there is no support. I can't just pick up the phone and, and talk to somebody and say, hey, you know, why isn't this working? I've got to uh, pound my head into a desk for about half an hour to get that figured out. So, <laughs> um, but it, it's a fun process. Okay, so ultimately our decision was to make our own. So um, we didn't feel that the other solutions, uh, paid where or free, uh, were really fitting our needs um, and decided that with the amount of runway that we had, uh, about, a, about a year, we would go ahead and dive both feet in to developing out our own solution. Um, so we decided to um, kind of build out a, a development cycle that said we wanted to have something in place to proof a concept this within three to four months. And then once we had that three to four month um, launch occur, we needed to have a six month evaluation of, okay, what did we run into? What are the things we need to improve? What do we need to change? Does this, is this gonna be sustainable? And so that's exactly what we did. So real quick before I go into all of that, I just wanna kind of mention this really quick. Occam's razor, if you're not familiar with it, and this is my interpretation of it, is the simple explanation is generally preferred over the more complex one. And so I always keep this in the back of my head when I develop out new tools, new processes, because it's really easy to go uh, uh, to, to, to allow what, what developers call feature creep, where we say we want it to do X, Y, and Z, and that list just get, generates longer and longer and longer, and you end up never building any of those components or pieces and making the tool um, too bloated, too large. Um, so we, you know, this kind of always reminds me to take a step back, build only what's required and do it in the simplest, simplest way possible, and then go through the process of adding more complexities to the project if need be, but justify it. Um, along with that, and this is um, just so that, I, I like humor, sorry. <laughs> my friend, he's a mechanical engineer. Um, he had a boss one time and he told me this and it's always resonated in my head. But he goes, I am man, not beast. I will modify my environment. And so you kind of have to have that mindset of, yeah, there may not, there may not be an easy path to our, our goal, um, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't strive to make sure we can get there. Um, so having those two things in the back of my, my, my mind, anytime I hit a barrier, I'm always thinking simplify it and don't be afraid to try to tackle it. So I would encourage if anybody else is in a similar situation or um, is looking at, you know, they're, they're keeping their, their feet out of the fire because they're not, they're not sure of what the outcome may be, you know, you're not going to make change if you don't try. So, um, okay, so here's our development timeline really quick. So we started developing our software in May 2016. Um, it was our first, uh, the, the first set of software that we developed was our session manager client and staff management piece. So that was our three month goal. We wanted to say, hey, within three months of starting development, we need to have a proof of concept in place and launched. And that allows us to start evaluating and collecting information to see if this is sustainable to go full uh, deployment. 
So um, we pilot launched in August of 2016 on our teen systems. Um, we had, um, at the time, we only had four teen computers. And then when we made that launch, we also coupled that with a small redesign of our teen room to allow for eight systems to be available. So we were deployed on the pilot on all eight of those systems. And then um, you can kind of see here the development kind of shifted to developing out print management and cost recovery. So during this, and let's see if I can use the pointer here. Uh, so during this um, period right here in green, that was focused only on developing the session management time um, piece of it and the, the staff management for that. Um, we didn't even come, we didn't even start working on print management until after August 2016. Um, so what that meant is during this pilot program on the teen room, printing was um, basically free. We just allowed print jobs to go straight to the printer and we didn't worry about cost recovery. Now, before we decided, decided on that, uh, we did evaluate the um, historical, um, um, basically, we looked at how much printing was happening on those teen computers historically and were able to, um, you know, uh, project what the cost may be if we allowed printing for free. Um, and we were able to uh, absorb that, which was good. So during this uh, blue section, if you will, between August 2016 and September 2017, that was hyper-focused on developing out print management and cost recovery, as well as handling any um, hiccups, bumps, hurdles that we ran into with our pilot program, um, which surprisingly were very few and far between. So that was why we were able to focus so much on developing out uh, the print management piece. Now, you may ask, why did it take so long for print management and cost recovery to happen? Um, it took us three months to develop out the client software and, and staff management side. That was the easy part, if you will. But then as I started developing out print management, I discovered it is much harder than I realized. Um, so, so we kind of had to um, you know, get a machete and start chopping through the woods there. And uh, it took us about a year to figure out that um, there is a path through the woods. It's not easy. It's always uphill. Um, and uh, it, it's not perfect. <laughs> so um, long story short, after we had um, developed out the print management and cost recovery portion, and cost recovery means just way for ways for patrons to pay for those print jobs. Um, so a mechanism for depositing coins, bills, using credit card processing, whatever. Um, once we had um, made it through that development, we were able to integrate that into our session manager um, environment. And then we went ahead and uh, did about a month worth of testing, if, uh, just testing you know, what had we seen on the team computers, can we replicate that on our test environment? kind of just to say, hey, are there any big snafus we're going to run into before we go live on this? Um, and then we made the push um, and, and uh, pushed everything out full deployment September 2017. Um, so um, we're sitting at, you know, 5-21-2018, and I still have a job. So, so far, it's gone pretty well. <laughs> um, so we went ahead and launched, and then um, basically kind of evaluated the system there and saw what were we running to at a larger scale because the problems are going to be different. You have a different patron base that are using it. You have different things that those patrons are doing on the computers. Um, so teens play games. They listen to media. They watch, you know, YouTube. Adults do all of the, the, the below, but also have more business-related tasks that they're trying to accomplish. So there's things that we had to evaluate and see, okay, what are we problematically running into um, going forward? Again, Pleasantly, we didn't run into too many issues. I'm not going to say, again, it's perfect, but um, for the most part, it, it is, it's a, a stable and sustainable system at this, at this point. So with that, we were able to move forward. And just recently, starting in April 2018, um, I started uh, developing out the Session Manager uh, V2. Um, and this is just the client software that's going to run on the public computers. And then we're going to be revamping our print management a little bit. And I'm going to talk about that. So that gives you kind of a timeline. And going forward, we don't really have an established hard set of, of dates or, or um, goals that we want to say by a certain date we want to have everything running and, and out. But once we have kind of a, um, I think what, what, I'm, what I'm getting as V2 of our session manager and our print solution is what I ultimately want to bring to the public at large. And so that's what will be released for free for um, 
various libraries to use as, as they see fit. So, um, so I want to talk really quick about our client um, topology or our system topology, if you will. So basically, we used open source um, scripting and tools to be able to develop this, this um, uh, solution out. So we knew we had client computers. We knew we needed to have some type of a server running session management. We needed some way for print jobs to be handled, um, you know, and, and also managing the actual printers on the network. And then we needed a way of capturing cost for those print jobs. In addition to that, we wanted to make sure any session that the clients created in our system had the ability of traversing the internet and going out to our ILS system um, and uh, authenticating the user. Um, in our environment, um, we're part of a consortium and our um, ILS system is hosted in Boise, Idaho. Um, and so that's why we have this model here. It's not an internal piece of our network. We have to um, tunnel out and, and uh, talk to our ILS remotely. So we had to kind of keep that in consideration as well. So um, as you can see, our first get go, uh, our, our first attempt, V1, um, the client software was developed in Python, um, the scripting language. Um, and then uh, the session manager server was, I'm a PHP guy, I have been for a very long time, so that was just kind of my uh, feel-good language to, to develop in. So I created a PHP MySQL backend um, server that would handle session management and also talk out to our ILS for authentication. Um, with that, developed out a um, print server, uh, again running PHP MySQL and Python. Um, and then also had to develop out a payment kiosk that the patrons could interact with that uses PHP, MySQL, and Python running on it as well. And in addition to that, we had to uh, work with a third-party vendor called JMEX, um, and they're the ones that provide the actual coin op itself that does the bill and coin counting. And um, th th that's kind of a, another story for another day, but a really cool story in the fact that that company um, kind of heard me out, understood where I was uh, trying to go with things as far as developing our own solution and then releasing it out to the wild as a, a free tool. And they actually uh, dedicated some um, uh, developers to helping me uh, work with their protocols, to work with their, their coin op. And ultimately, the CEO decided to allow um, his developers to create a software development kit um, that will be released with their coin ops if you run our, our, our system, so, um, which is fantastic. I um, have to give them a lot of props for taking the initiative and, and, and doing that. Uh, but like I said, that's another story for another day, but we are using coin ops from JMEX, and their protocol allows us to, to communicate with those coin ops over um, uh, multiple platforms, so Windows, Linux, Mac. Um, so anyway, just wanted to mention that. And then um, that's basically the, the, the system topology. Um, right here, it might seem a little confusing of a matrix here, but basically what this depicts is a client is able to talk and establish session management um, with the server, as well as independently talk to a print server. So we've basically, the print server and the session manager are not one and the same. They're completely different modules, if you will. And so that allows us to be a really flexible as to how we deploy this. So I know I've been rambling on for a while. Does anybody have any major questions before I move forward? I think I'm sitting at about 35 minutes of yabbering. I think it's going great, Adam. Uh, we see, I see Clay typing in the chat here. See if he's got a question for you. Oh, good. A couple questions, maybe. Couple questions. So we'll give everybody just a minute, and it gives me a breather. <laughs> <laughs> so Jeff's asking, when is V2 ready? It's coming, Jeff. I promise. It's coming. <laughs> so the hardware side, what printer compatibility issues, uh, if any, did you run into? I know our print management software required some special drivers. Great question, Clay. Um, so I'm going to actually talk about that here in the next few slides. So um, let me see if I can address it there, and if not, just yell at me and I'll, I'll get back with you on that one. So, okay, so we'll move forward if nobody else has any other questions. Okay, I wanted to just really quickly skim off the surface of talking about uh, kind of a process that we used was we wanted to develop software based off the policy that we established. Um, as you can imagine, you know, what we have established our policies to be as an institution may not match what the actual feature sets or capability of what software we're trying to run 
uh, has. So, so they, they don't mesh. And so we took the stance of, well, if we're going to build our own, let's define our policy. Let's really figure out what we wanted, and then let's make sure the tool can handle that. And so we went through this process as well. So here's just a, some quick highlights of our policy rules, just, uh, just generalized. We wanted to require a barcode to be able to log in. We wanted to make sure we had express sessions for patrons that didn't have barcodes or weren't willing to sign up for a card. Even though we have free internet cards, there are those situations where patron maybe just be traveling through and they just need quick access to this, the public computers to check an email, print a ticket, and get going. So we wanted to make sure we built that into our, our system. Um, we decided to tackle the, I forgot my PIN question, by removing the PIN requirement for login. Um, I know, that sounds scary. <laughs> but what we've pleasantly found is that it has completely alleviated that question, because naturally we're not asking for it. But we haven't run into a situation yet, knock on wood, that a patron has had a security risk because of that. So we wanted to play around with that a little bit and just see if that was a uh, viable way of, of tackling that problem. And so um, since launch, we, we haven't required a PIN number and we haven't run into any problems. So again, knock on wood. <laughs> Um, our patrons, we wanted to make sure we're guaranteed a minimum of 120 minutes or two hours a day um, while our library is open, of course. Um, and we wanted to apply that in such a way that we're calling it um, persistent sessions. So if somebody were to sit down and log into our computer in the morning, say they use uh, fifth or 10 minutes of time on the session log out, um, they would essentially still have 110 minutes um, or an hour and 50 minutes of time to be able to use our system. Uh, later on in the day. And so if the patron came back at any point during that, that calendar day, they would be able to log in and they're still guaranteed that minimum of 110 minutes on our system. Um, so that's kind of what that talks about. Uh, we, we wanted to make sure we removed any type of daily login limit. I don't care how you come in and use our computers as far as when and at what times. It's up to you. You are guaranteed that 120 minutes. And you, as a patron, they can decide when to log in and log out as they need. Um, the one thing that we did in a unique fashion was we, uh, we wanted to get rid of our um, PC reservation system. So we, in the old system, we had a, a reservation station that would, um, if, if like all computers are being used, a patron could log into that reservation station and reserve a computer for a, a later time. So when a session ends, they would be allowed to sit down and, and log into that. What we discovered was even during our busiest times of the day, patrons weren't using that for, for a multitude of reasons. One, they just didn't care to. Two, uh, the tool just wasn't working very well. Um, and three, the, it's kind of an on-demand thing. People were coming in with the expectation of I should have access to a computer and I don't want to have to wait till somebody else is done. So long story short, nobody was using that, that station. So how do we develop an environment that doesn't have that, but yet can still be fair to all patrons to allow them to have their required amount of time, but still make availability of computers to those that haven't had their opportunity to use a computer yet? So what we had done, uh, or what, what we have done, is we've, we've required a 30-minute break between consecutive sessions. And so what that means is once you have utilized your 120 minutes, after that last login has expired, so you've hit your 120-minute marks, the system logs you off, you were required to wait 30 minutes from that point in time before it'll let you log back in. So what that has naturally done is there are always computers available, but they're not just sitting there at idle all day. So, so far that's worked out really well, and we haven't seen too much of an issue of patrons waiting in line for, for systems. Not to say that that doesn't happen, but there, there, we don't have people lining up out the door waiting for computers. So um, kind of another thing that we, we wanted to tackle was uh, we wanted to make sure we ensured that a single computer was used with a single barcode when people logged in. Um, however, we recognize that there's situations where um, that's not always necessarily the, the right thing to do as far as a customer service um, standpoint is concerned. Um, so a case in point, let's say you have a parent that brings in their children and the parent wants to log in their children to the computers, but some of the children either may not have bar or, or library cards for various reasons, either an age or parent you know, decision of not giving them cards at this point, but they still wanted to be able to allow their kids onto the computers. Um, the, the parent would have to engage with staff, and our system would allow that staff member to add that barcode uh, to a multi-session card 
um, list. And so basically, it's a, it, it, once that barcode is on that list, it's available for the next three hours from the time it's added. That patron can use that same barcode and log into our systems with multiple computers. Um, and what's really great about the system is that we can handle and manage each one of those sessions individually, even if they have the same barcode. So, um, you know, the, the, that's the, those two things right there really call out kind of the customizable feature sets that we wanted that we really were not seeing um, with third party solutions. Um, but again, it was just because this is our experience and this is what we thought we could solve. And so that's how we developed it out. Um, the other thing that we wanted to make sure we could do is, uh, for the most part, any patron can go to any zone and log in adult or child. But we did recognize that there are those situations where you do need to limit which zones certain patrons log into. And so our system does have the ability of, of limiting, let's say, a patron from logging into the kids zone or a kid logging into the adult zone. Um, the next piece of it, and we've kind of talked about a little bit, is the ILS compatibility. Um, so we did want to make sure authentication could happen with the ILS. Um, but we also wanted to make sure that the system was independent of the ILS so that if the ILS ever went down, so go back to my, my uh, topology map, if you will, our ILS is hosted remotely and it's over the internet and things happen where we lose connection with that, that ILS. What we didn't want to do is have it to where when the ILS goes down, our system goes down. So our system's able to be toggled on or off based off of the availability of the ILS to allow patrons to authenticate to the ILS if available. But if not, it still requires a barcode. It still allows them to log in. And then it gives our staff information as to who is legitimately logged in when the ILS becomes available. And I'll show a, a quick example of that. OK. So our V1 tool set, just really quick, these are the, we, we ran with a, a uh, Zubuntu 16.04 LTS desktop environment. We ran with the Zubuntu because, or XFCE is the, the, inter, the desktop interface, Ubuntu is the core operating system. So that's why I have XUbuntu. So XFCE4 um, is, is the, the reason we went with it is because it's highly customizable. If you were trying to run Ubuntu with either the Unity interface or GNOME or any of the other desktop managers, um, Ubuntu really stood out because we were able to develop an environment that patrons were comfortable with um, and that we could control very um, easily. Um, we developed our software with Python 2.7 and uh, using the, the Tkinter um, GUI framework. So basically, Python is doing all the back-end scripting, you know, behind-the-scenes stuff. Tkinter is the framework that allows us to make windowed environments uh, for the software, so what the patron actually looks at and sees. Um, Tkinter worked really great because it's packaged with Python, um, but it's, it, it, it feels and looks old. <laughs> um, and it's kind of clunky to work with, but that's how we got started and, and, and kind of launched into it. Um, we created our print server using the CUPS um, print service. Um, and um, we actually have run into some issues with that. So kind of go back to Clay's question, um, you know, the CUPS print service definitely works. However, um, I, will, I will just put it this way. Windows does have superior drivers when it comes to printing. <laughs> and so some of the issues that we we're running into is there would be large print jobs that wouldn't come through the system correctly. We would get blank pages sometimes. It wouldn't render. Um, the actual print job appropriately when, when released to the printer. And so because of that, we're kind of transitioning away from that. And in our V2 set, uh, we're going to um, kind of look at that problem a little differently. Um, we're currently still running CUPS as our print server. And, um, you know, uh, we've, we've stabilized things out right now, so we're not running into as many problems. But it's one of those things where this was an unforeseen issue. <laughs> Um, but I think we've, we've, with V2, we've addressed those problems and we've made it a pretty stable system. So um, again, when, when this becomes available to the public, that's the intent is to release the version two of this. So um, all of the, all of the um, servers that we're running run PHP MySQL um, backends. And so that's our, our web server, our print server as, as of right now. And that'll continue to be even on V2, as well as our, our kiosk. So, um, so when we launched, I want to go over real quick what we discovered. We were running a stable desktop environment. The Ubuntu XSCE environment has worked really well. Patrons weren't out there with pitchforks and fires saying that they demanded Windows back. But that's because we designed the system to 
basically look and feel. We're not trying to mimic Windows, but we wanted to make sure we put things in places where people were familiar with it. And so that transition seemed to be pretty easy for most patrons. Yes, we had our you know, one or two problematic um, 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 situations where a patron was just like, I don't know how to use it because now things are completely different. But with just a little bit of staff time and guidance, um, those patrons are always using our computers on a daily basis without issue. So um, again, you know, change is one of those finicky things, but change does happen and, and we just work around it the best we can. So, and like I mentioned in the last slide, the Comps Print Server Stability and Driver Support had issues. And so we're, we're looking at changing that going forward. So in our next steps, we want to improve print reliability. We want to develop our client software so it runs off a single code set. We only have to develop one set of code that can then run on all three major platforms, Windows, Linux, and uh, Mac. Um, going back to talking about JMEX and their SDK that they developed, right now um, I have access to their protocol. Um, but I can't release that protocol out to the wild, so hence they developed out an SDK. So I need to bake that into our solution so that when it goes out to the wild, it's just a seamless transition. So if you use a JMEX unit, our software will just talk to their unit without issue. Um, and then the next steps in the far future, not too far future, but in the distance, um, we do want to release this out to the wild for the public at large. So um, with that in mind, Going forward, V2 toolset, we're going to be using the desktop environment, um, uh, Ubuntu as well, XFCE, but we're going to move to 18.04, which was just recently released. I've actually started deving against that, and it seems to be working really nicely. We're going to transition away from Python for our client software, and we're going to move into using the Electron framework, um, which basically uses HTML, uh, basically web technologies and scripting to develop client-side software. So that's that single code set, multiple platform capability. Um, we are going to be transitioning away from um, the CUPS print server, and we are going to be utilizing Python to create a print service that will run on top of Windows. Um, this is, I think, acceptable in the sense that a single Windows license is an affordable option to be able to achieve what this is trying to do. Um, so depending on your environment and if you're a small library with only 10 systems, this is going to work fantastic. If you're a library like us that has 40 or 50 systems, again, Windows 10 Pro license is going to work fantastic. If you have anything larger than that, you're probably going to have to move into like a Windows Server license for those connections to occur. Um, but again, that scales with the size of your network, which probably coincides with, with budgets as well. So um, that's the intent there. Again, everything stays the same on the server side. Um, PHP and MySQL will kind of manage the back end of everything at that point. So um, let's go into V1 user interfaces. I'm sitting at uh, 50 minutes. Um, so that gives us about 10 minutes to kind of do a quick demo. Um, does anybody have any major questions before we move into that? Thanks, Adam. I, I think you can jump straight into the demo, and yeah, if people have any questions during the demo, we'll uh, we'll address them. Sounds good. Um, so I'm going to roll into just some quick screenshots. We're not going to spend a lot of time on them, and then I'll go into the demo itself. So basically, this is the interface that the patron is um, uh, faced with as soon as they sit down with our computers. Single text box, allows them to type in their barcode and start a full session button, starts the session. Um, this is the desktop environment example. So this is Ubuntu 16.04 LTS running XF, XFCE4. And so we were able to um, create an environment that seemed familiar. And sorry if this keeps popping up. Um, try not to move my mouse too much. But over here you have a menu. Um, the menu will open up and give access to whatever software tools that we're allowing for. All the software that we're running is available off of the uh, Ubuntu repository. So it's open source and free software. Um, the big question there is, you know, what are we using for our Office suite? And we're just running the standard release of LibreOffice. Um, and we've all, the only thing we've done is we've changed the preferences to the, that, that suite to um, save and to open, um, you know, Microsoft, form, Microsoft Office format files. Um, so it doesn't save as the, um, you know, the, oh, the ODF or ODT formats, it's opening and, close, and, and saving um, uh, files as uh, DOCX, uh, PPTX, that type of format. Um, so they have a session manager window that gives them, you know, how much time you have left, you know, hour, minute, second. Um, the session time will end about this at, at this time. 
They have a few tools to work with. They can look at what print jobs they've sent to the print queue. They can lock their computer in case they need to step away for a moment and then log back in. And then, of course, they can end the session. So simple stuff like notifications. Uh, we built in a way that uh, the patron can increase or decrease fonts um, of the environment. So those that may not have the, the greatest of eyesight, they can increase that font and hopefully that helps them out. Um, that was a, a very difficult thing to do in Windows that I, I discovered. Uh, but with Linux, it was it was pretty straightforward. So kind of an, another benefit there, if you will. And then, of course, just simple volume control access so that they can, you know, increase, decrease volume as needed. So um, this is a look at the public session manager. So basically, when um, staff log in, they have access to this. It's not patron facing. Um, all sessions that are running will be listed like you see here, just stacked. So more sessions down here. In this case, we only have one session to show. And it's on use services number four. Here's the barcode. You'll notice that has a check mark and it's in green. Um, gives us a start time, end time, button array to increase or decrease session times on the fly. Um, the X will end the session for the patron. So if we need to end the patron session for whatever reason, that's where we do that. We have the way of uh, the ability to administratively lock the computer. So say we have a situation crop up where the staff need to investigate what's going on, but we just don't want to kill the session to the user. Um, we can we can lock that uh, that session, meaning it'll pop up with a, a lock screen and prevent anything else from being viewed until the staff can interact. We also have the ability of sending messages to individual systems as well as groups of systems, and the staff have the ability to see into the print queues for those individuals. So, um, printer doesn't spit out the job correctly, they can reissue the job, they can you know refund money if needed be. Um, it gives them those capabilities. So, um, and we'll kind of demo. A, that really, really quickly. So just go through these little pop-ups. Okay, so here was our teen room, just to give you a, kind of a, a snapshot of what I was talking about earlier, how we rearranged things in our teen room. Um, over here you had, um, you know, shelves and magazine racks, and we had our computers behind this shelf right here, so they kind of sat over here. There were only four systems, and we wanted to rearrange the room to allow for eight systems. So ultimately, um, we rearranged the room and then converted these bookshelves and had a custom carpenter come in and create this bench style desk that allowed us to increase our, our station size and still be able to utilize the room in, in, in the same ways that we were in the past. So, um, you know, this, this is how the room looks and this is actually just after we had launched our, our system uh, for the pilot. So. Um, here's our print release station. Again, we had a cabinet maker create us this uh, um, custom sized cabinet that would fit the coin op and a touch screen interface to work with that um, print release station. So this is the JMix unit I had referred to earlier, and this is a Raspberry Pi running on a 10 inch um, touch screen. Um, what's really great about this is that the kiosk is just a website. So um, this doesn't have to be a touch screen. It doesn't have to be a Raspberry Pi. It could be just a standard desktop uh, with keyboard and mouse that patrons could use to interact with. And this is all hosted on the actual ser uh, a server elsewhere. So it's, it's deployable anywhere within your network. Um, so here's just a closer look of it and a breakdown of just kind of how that layout is. We had the carpenter make an, I, this little picture frame for it, and that's worked out pretty well. Um, haven't had too many issues with it, actually. So um, again, just a kind of a cheap and affordable solution for that type of interface. Um, and here's a video, we're not going to go into it, but it just shows the process of what the patron would go through to release a job. But since we're kind of crunched on time, I want to get to the live demo just really quick. Um, if, you, if anybody wants to see this, shoot me an email. I'll be happy to, to pass you a link and, and you can kind of um, look and see how that, that process works. So, okay, with that, let me dive into the demo. So this is a virtual machine running our public print server, or excuse me, uh, session manager. So this is the Ubuntu 1604 uh, environment. And so patrons can log in. So I'll just use my barcode here really quick. And they're prompted to see you know, our computer use policy, which we can customize as needed. Um, they can either agree or cancel. And then here's the desktop environment like I showed you earlier. So again, this is V1. So this is what we're currently running right now. Um, they have access to software. We have the ability to launch um, you know, word processor, um, Google Chrome, Firefox, whatever we need to. Um, I'm going to go ahead and try to release a print or send a print job just to show you that process. Um, so we're going to send a test print job to the queue, um, open up our print environment. It sends a job, gives the patron notification that that job was successfully sent to the queue. Notice there is no um, pop-up for this is how much is on your account because we don't care at this point. We just want to release the job to the queue and then when the patron walks up to the print release station, they can log in and um, resolve the account um, balance at that point. 
So if they click on print, uh, pending print jobs, um, not showing up there, why not? <laughs> so anyway, they would be able to see the, the, the print job there and they can manage it by, they wouldn't be able to release the job, but they could go ahead and remove the job from the queue. Let's say you send a job uh, erroneously and you, you wanted to remove that from the queue before you got to the print side, uh, print release station. Um, they can lock their system and when they get back, they have to use their barcode to log back in. Okay. Um, and then let me show you the session management piece. So this is a demo site that I'm running on our public server, public uh, website actually. So um, what's cool about this is it shows the scalability of the product. Um, I'm running this desktop manager or the desktop session internal on our network, but I'm using our public web server to manage it. So if you had multiple branches, this could be a potential way of, of handling that. So once logged in, we can see, hey, which computer they're logged into, the barcode that's currently logged in. This will stay spinning until it authenticates with the ILS. So in the event that the patron doesn't log in with a, a valid barcode and the ILS isn't available, when the ILS comes back up, staff will either see a green check mark or a red, uh, red X. And what that indicates is that, hey, this barcode isn't necessarily valid and staff need to investigate. It doesn't end the session for the patron. It just gives staff more information to make a more informed decision. Um, gives them start time, end time, like I showed. We can increase, decrease time. So I'm going to increase our time by uh, 60 minutes. It'll take a few seconds, but we should see that update. So there we go. We now have an additional hour, and it just scales on the fly. Um, we have the ability to lock the system administratively. So I just locked it. And then we have a pop-up here that shows that the system no longer can be used. They can't. This window is on top. Nothing else can be on top of it. The session is still running in the background. So this is allowing staff to interact with the situation and make decisions before ending a session to a patron. So we can unlock that. And we'll see that unlock here in just a moment. OK. Um, we also have the ability to send messages. So um, let me go back here. So if we click on Send Message for this, it'll list out all the active sessions in the systems. In this case, there's only one. And that's the one we want to send a message to. So we can send that message. And naturally, it'll pop up a message saying, hey, you know, this is the message, and make the patron interact with that. As you can see, the software is, is it's not pretty. <laughs> uh, but that's the Tkinter uh, framework to, that we use to, to get going. Um, we want to make changes to that to make it more um, prettified, if you will. Um, and let's see, there's, there's more to it than that. We can restrict accounts. Uh, we can establish different zones, which computers are associated with each, each zone. Uh, we can administratively lock computers before they're logged into. So if we need to do maintenance, we can do that. Here's the multi-session card. So if I wanted to take my barcode and log into multiple computers at the same time, um, this, this barcode can now uh, log into as many stations as they need to until 4.33 today. So and we can easily remove that, that um, barcode from the list if needed. Our break override basically allows for if a patron's utilized their full two hours but requires additional time and they've been logged out, and it's giving them a, hey, you need to wait 30 minutes, um, they, the staff can come in here and add their barcode to or just submit their barcode, and that allows the, the, the patron to log back in and start a new session fresh. So that's up to staff discretion. And then, of course, we have our reports. So um, this is just the demo site, so pretty low numbers. But this gives us the ability to search by barcode, kind of see a, a login history if required. Um, we are able to see how many sessions were generated, um, broken down by month, you know, session, you know, or computer, uh, computer system-wise. So we can see which, which computers are being used the most if we needed to. Um, so that's kind of just in a nutshell um, the public session manager side of it. So um, I know we're, we're four minutes over time. I can show you V2 if you guys are willing to stay on with me for an extra five minutes. Um, if not, go ahead and uh, uh, take off and, and reach out to me later, and I'd be happy to sit down and, and do a demo with you on a one-on-one -on -one if, if possible. Thanks, Adam. That sounds great. I think that's a great plan. And um, also, we'll, we'll keep recording, too. So if anyone does have to take off, um, the recording will be available later as well. Looks like somebody's typing, so we'll give everybody just a chance to respond, and then I'll, I'll yeah. forge forward for another few minutes. Great. OK, thanks, thanks Christy. I appreciate it. Thank you. OK, so I'll go ahead and move forward. Um, 
So uh, let me go ahead and end the session here on this this system, and then I'll spin up the the version two. Now I'll give you a, just kind of a, a quick uh, heads up. The version two of our software um, I've just started working on it in the in the past month, and um, it's not fully ready. So the demo I'm going to show you is going to have some of the basics working, but some of the other things aren't. Um, but it'll give you a better idea of kind of the direction we're moving and what's going to be available to the public when we, we get to that point. So let me spin up the next uh, virtual machine here, and this will take just a moment for it to turn on. Um, but this will kind of give you an idea of the boot process. Again, we're running um, Ubuntu or XFCE on top of Ubuntu uh, 18.04. We're using an Electron uh, framework to develop out our client-side software. Um, uh, print management hasn't been built into this um, um, tool just yet, or this tool set just yet. That's my, my next thing in the next few weeks. Um, and right now I'm focusing on being able to develop a single code set that works for all, all platforms. And that does take a minute to, to uh, develop out because the way that sessions are created and destroyed on the um, client computer are different between the different environments. So we have to account for that when we do our development. So system model logs in just like the other one does. Uh, we'll establish a new um, work environment for the patron um, and then it should launch the session manager tool which will just lay on top of, of the system. Um, so this is, this is on top. They can't alt tab. They can't alt F4. I'm hitting those buttons right now. Nothing's happening. Um, this is the Electron interface, so um, if they put in an erroneous barcode, it gives them immediate feedback, hey, not so much. Um, they're able to log in, it gives them some direct feedback, that spinny circle means it's actually talking out to our ILS and it's come back with a reply saying, yep, this is valid barcode. Gives them the option of agreeing or canceling to our policy, so if they cancel, it just takes the system back to the state it was for the next patron. Um, so we'll log in again, hit agree. Um, you can see there's a little bit of a different layout and different look to the session manager. Um, this we felt was a little more clean, a little easier to understand. Um, we can still see print queue information, and sorry, it kind of scales weird on the, the the virtual machine, so the window's a little big for that, but we can still work with it. So this is where your print jobs would be listed, um, which you could re you know remove or see what how many jobs you've submitted into the queue. They can review the computer policy at any time they needed to if, if there's a situation where that needed to happen. Um, they have the ability of locking their computer like the other system does. Um, this is just a little more user friendly and we've built in some additional security steps where you can't try to brute force your way into a locked system. Not that that's happened in the past, but we wanted to kind of address that ahead of time before it became a problem. Um, when that happens, um, the you can see we have our session right here. Um, Administratively, the uh, staff can take over the session by hitting lock, and you'll see that transition to system unavailable. And then the staff can unlock the system, which will destroy the locked environment and restore the session back to where the, the, the patron was. So if they were running software in the background or whatever the situation may be, that hasn't gone away. That was just being blocked by the screen. So, and if they forgot their password or somebody, you know, they're typing it wrong five or six times, they could at least go to staff and get that unlocked without, you know, things ending. Um, we can send messages. So, um, again, similar process. Again, same management tool. This is the exact same management tool we're using on V1. So now we're going to go ahead and send a hello message um, to uh, V2 um, version. And you can see it's much more prominent. It's more, hey, you have to see this message. You can't tell me you didn't. <laughs> and more importantly, it, it captures that screen on, in front of everything else. So if, if you know, they're doing something and they don't, you know, a small pop-up they don't see and they easily can just click away from it and continue what they're doing, this kind of gets in their way until they hit acknowledge. And now they say, okay, yep, you're good to go. Now you can go ahead and use the system as you were um, doing just before. Um, so that's that's pretty much the long and short of it. Um, I've shown you um, how the login process is, the basic overview of the desktop environment. Um, we've adjusted uh, session times. Um, oh, I guess I could end the session. So um, if the staff needed to, they could go ahead and just end the session. And that should just kill our session here in just a moment. Oh, let's see. Again, dev environment, so um, we're not quite there yet. But as you can see, it did end the session and uh, brought the system back up so the next patron can sit there and try to log in. So um, again, since I ended it administratively, the, set, the patron is allowed to log back in again. 
Um, so we now have a fresh new session for, for my, my setup. So um, yeah, so that's, that's version one. Version two, that's the state of the product, if you will. Um, uh, my goals and my intent are to uh, get this polished out and to a point where we can um, uh, allow uh, other libraries to download this and implement it into their own environment and uh, go from there. So stay in touch. Um, email me if you're interested, and I'd be happy to keep you abreast as to where we are with things. Um, and uh, that's all I have to say, I guess. Oh, I sorry, we have a question. Um, Jeff is asking, does the management software have the ability to turn on and off computers according to the library hours? Um, good question. So yes, and it's all dependent on your environment. So the way that I'm handling that on mine is our computers um, are uh, receiving what are co what's called a magic packet um, over the network to turn on. Um, looks like Clay has a question as well here. Um, so a magic packet goes out on our network and, and basically tells the computers to uh, turn on. So that's how we're handling it. It has nothing to do with the session manager. That's just how our environment is. Um, if you're running a Linux box or a Linux server, even a Windows box, there are tools that allow you to do that administratively on your network that are free and easy to do. So um, that's how that portion's handled. Um, but to kind of talk to that point, if we go under settings here, we have the ability of, and again, this is the demo, so this isn't really what our times are here at the, the library, but we can define um, closure times of the library. So we can say, hey, we close at this time. So what I'm going to do is say, hey, you know, on a Monday, we close at 9 p.m. So I will change this to show 8.50 p.m. is when our session managers will, or the session manager will allow people to log in and will automatically log people off. Now, with that, let's say a patron is guaranteed two hours. They log in an hour before closing. The patron's not going to receive a two-hour session. They're going to receive how, however many minutes are left over for that business day, depending on what time you implement here in the, the closure time. So it kind of it, it does allow for, for patrons to log in, have a session up to the point of closing. So we can you can customize that if you need to. Um, here you can adjust your, and right now they're all in seconds, um, but you can adjust your session lengths. You can turn on and off uh, SIP compatibility. So is it talking to SIP or not? Um, this is our express session duration. So when a, an express session is generated without a barcode, they have 15 minutes on our computers. You can customize that if needed. Multi-session expiration, which is the three-hour mark. So that just says, hey, for the next three hours, this card can log in multiple times. And then, um, oh, excuse me, I was wrong. Session duration is right here. That's the two hours. Uh, this is the 30 minute break between sessions. So uh, all that's changeable and customizable as needed. Um, we can also add zones to our computer, uh, computers to different zones so you can mix and match as you need to in your environment. So all that's in there as well. So I hope that answers your question, Jeff. Thank you, Adam. Awesome. Any Jason, other? Do you have one? Yeah, any other questions? Um, excuse me. In the chat? And <laughs> <laughs> excellent. I look forward to it. Thank you. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Um, <clears throat> so, okay. Well, I hope that was informative. I, I know it was me blabbling on quite a bit, and we didn't get to really play around with the software too much. But like I said, if you are truly interested in this, please reach out to me. I'd be happy to, to um, um, do a remote session with you guys, let you play around with it, um, get an idea of how it works, and, and whether it could be something that's feasible in your environment. Um, and we'll just go from there. So again, thank you for everybody's time. And again, thank you to the ICFL and Dylan and Tammy for hosting this. This is a great opportunity, um, and um, I just really appreciate it. We we want to thank you very much, Adam. This was a fantastic was great. Thanks, Adam. presentation. And uh, like I said, the recording will be available. So if you have any uh, anyone who attended, any colleagues that you think uh, would benefit from seeing this, we will get that link out real soon. Um, I also have to beg and plead you that uh, anyone who participated, I'm going to be sending out a evaluation, something we are required to do because this is uh, funded by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. So when you get that evaluation link for me, it's super short, it's not hard. So if you could actually fill that evaluation out, I would greatly appreciate it. Um, but I thank you all for attending today, and I really thank our presenter, Adam, for sharing his wisdom and knowledge with us. And I think he provided his email, but if you have any trouble getting hold of Adam, feel free to contact either Tammy or I, and we will 
pass it along to Adam as well. And uh, we really appreciate your uh, sticking around for this info to go. And I think with that, we will turn you all loose. I have one quick announcement. Our info to go for next month in June, on June 18th, is about Live Better Idaho. We're going to have Robbie Jackson here from the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare uh, telling us about a community-focused web service that can help us connect library users with Idaho services for better health, education, family needs, and work. So please uh, come back on June 18th. Uh, go to the info to go page on our website if you want to register for that one or any other ones coming up later this year as well. And uh, thank you very much and uh, really appreciate you guys and have a great rest of your week. Thank you.